Good afternoon, everyone. I suppose we are online across Europe now. I greet uh, all uh, participants uh, from different European countries uh, who found their way today to our presentation. I'm counting in total about 15 plus countries from North Norway to Hungary, Czech Republic, UK, Russia, Spain, Italy, uh, Belgium and many other countries uh, are online with us today and uh, I must say I'm very pleased uh, that you have found uh, time to be with us uh, today. Today we present our Greenland program to you. My name is uh, Florian Piper. I'm responsible for the Arctic program of Oceanwide Expeditions and I also put it uh, together. Today with me is uh, Christian and uh, I would like to introduce him to you. Uh, he is our guest and keynote speaker. Um, he is situated in Norway at this moment of time and we are glad to have him on board. Christian, hi. Um, a short introduction to you, Christian, if you don't mind. Um, your studies brought you to Svalbard and that's also where you lived uh, for a few years. Uh, about 11 years ago, uh, very interesting. You started your career as a guide, an expedition leader, also as a passionate uh, kayak guide uh, in Svalbard, Greenland and in Antarctica. And in 2011, you started uh, working for us for the first time on one of our ships that is not uh, in promotion anymore. Um, that was back in uh, 2011 in Svalbard. And uh, since then, you have uh, gained a lot of experience as expedition leader um, with various programs and uh, ships. So I'm very glad that uh, you made it today um, here into our webinar. We have uh, had a few webinars already. Um, and uh, I suppose that uh, some of the viewers had the opportunity also to see um, the other uh, webinars uh, that have uh, been broadcasted uh, recently. Um, well, um, let's get started. I'll give you a short introduction on uh, on the company. Won't spend uh, too much time on that uh, because Christian has prepared a really nice uh, presentation for you. Now, let's uh, look at the uh, company. You see on this time scale, uh, we have some track record uh, looking back to the 1980s uh, uh, to the 1990s uh, where Oceanwide Expeditions uh, was uh, founded uh, as a company. Later on um, in the 2000, uh, around 2008 to 2009, we started uh, establishing our own fleet. Uh, we are owner and operator. Today we are operating four uh, expedition vessels, motor vessels, Plantius Ortelius, Hondius, and soon to come uh, Jansonius. And uh, we have one uh, three mass owner named Rembrandt van Rijn um, in our fleet. Now let's continue um, with uh, the next slide. Um, I'll give you a brief overview of our routes uh, across the polar regions. So we are operating only in the cold waters. And now on the uh, next map, you will see that uh, we go down south to Antarctica. Uh, we, we split our year in two seasons, uh, the Antarctic season and uh, uh, the Arctic season. Um, down south in Antarctica, in the Austral summer, uh, we spend uh, uh, our time there in the months between uh, November till March. Uh, during that time, uh, we pretty much travel up uh, and down the Antarctic Peninsula. That is the spine of the Antarctic uh, circled in a moment. You will see it there. Um, and uh, we also go to the northeast side, the Weddell Sea with our vessel uh, Ortelius. Ortelius is uh, custom built for this uh, kind of expedition because of uh, highest ice class and uh, helicopter deck uh, on the aft of the vessel. Uh, we carry two helicopters uh, to that kind of uh, region where uh, we have on occasion to overcome the ice barrier and uh, take the helicopters to the place where we want to land our passengers. 
We also have something very exclusive uh, in store for our polar travelers. Uh, we go south uh, as far as the Ross Sea. Uh, we start in Ushuaia. Uh, we go and half circumnavigate Antarctica, uh, touch base with the Antarctic Peninsula and then continue into the Ross Sea. Um, also on this expedition with uh, Ortelius, uh, we uh, carry two helicopters because we definitely have to overcome uh, ice barriers uh, where landings with zodiacs are not possible anymore physically. So we uh, take the hel helicopters out and uh, fly you into the dry valleys or into the remote stations of McMurdo and the historic uh, huts of uh, Shackleton and Scott. From there, we continue to New Zealand and we do the same trip in reverse uh, from New Zealand to South America. That's good. Um, that's for Antarctica. It's really just uh, uh, a nutshell uh, here uh, mentioned where we are going. So you have a bit of an imagination where we take our ships. Uh, we continue with the Arctic. Um, here, um, everything north of uh, the Arctic Circle is uh, uh, the places we are now focusing on. Uh, our ships are operating in Spitsbergen. Svalbard, uh, East Greenland and uh, North Norway. And uh, we are very proud to say that uh, we can operate uh, all year round, uh, not with all vessels, uh, but the motor vessels operate uh, in the core season, May to September in Spitsbergen. Then um, once the season has closed, end of August, beginning of September, we position our vessels to Northeast Greenland. Uh, and from there we carry on to Iceland. Now, um, the East Greenland part from Spitsbergen to uh, the far and remote places of uh, East Greenland is uh, Christian's part. Uh, he will talk in depth about that. Um, and uh, what makes us an all year round uh, player is that uh, we have uh, Rembrandt, our three mask owner in North Norway in the time between uh, November uh, till April for the Northern Lights, for the hiking, for the ski and sail, um, for the kayaking. Everything is possible from um, our floating uh, base camp. This is how we like to see our vessels. Now, um, coming to the next uh, slide. Uh, to give you a bit of an overview of uh, the ships that I have just uh, mentioned here briefly, um, you see Plantius on this picture. Um, on the next uh, slide, you see our three must go on Rembrandt van Rijn. Um, now, um, the ship has been uh, in operation in the Arctic uh, for several years. We started with Greenland, uh, we carried on with the North Norway. Now we are in Spitsbergen and Northeast Greenland with the vessel. Um, conducting really nice, unique, authentic programs, very close to nature. We only have 33 berths in 16 cabins. All cabins have ensuite facilities. We carry two zodiacs and we allow landings. So we operate on shore. We keep the sea legs as short as possible in order to spend a lot of time on land. Now, the motor vessel fleet is um, also very important for us because of highest ice class, our ships go into the remotest parts of the polar regions that you can think of. Um, we are operating north of Spitsbergen, uh, far uh, deep field in the pack ice. Um, we have 10 Zodiacs on board the Plantius, the Ortelius, the same thing. Both vessels are on uh, eye level because uh, we have uh, um, similar ice classes. We are operating in the highest ice class uh, segments and um, we uh, take about 108 passengers uh, per ship in uh, just over 50 uh, cabins, different types of cabins, uh, quads, uh, twin portals, and uh, up to uh, twin deluxe cabins and superior cabins, uh, everything that you like to uh, have more or less, a little bit more comfort or a little bit less. That's uh, the choice of the traveler. On Notalia, something very specific to know, um, I mentioned it earlier, we have a helicopter aft uh, deck, uh, um, which allows us to carry uh, two helicopters, which will be parked in a hangar um, when we don't need them, but we only operate the helicopters uh, in Antarctica. They won't be needed in the Arctic because in the Arctic in the summer, uh, we only operate uh, with Zodiacs and we land our passengers with uh, inflatable boats. Uh, uh, Christian will say a little bit about that in a moment. 
Now on the next slide, a uh, short introduction to our newest uh, vessels. Hondius started her maiden voyage in 2019 in the Arctic. We continued with Antarctica. Now the vessel, like all the other ships, are alongside in the Netherlands uh, because of this great, uh, great COVID situation. Um, so we are hibernating at the moment. Um, we think of great travel, but we all hope to be able to restart very soon uh, again, as soon as the, um, uh, the restrictions, the travel restrictions and everything had been lifted. Hondius carries 180 passengers in uh, just over 70 cabins. The same with uh, the newest uh, of all our ships, uh, Jansonius. So she is being built as we speak uh, in uh, Croatia. Um, um, she will be uh, the sister vessel of uh, uh, Hondius. Uh, also, we have uh, capacity for 180 passengers in just over 70 cabins. Uh, also, highest ice class uh, need to be mentioned. Uh, and uh, that is equivalent uh, to uh, 1A Super Polar Class 6. And uh, these ships will take you to all the interesting places in, uh, in the polar regions. Now, that's about us, uh, the routes and the ships. You see them here, uh, last slide on, um, uh, on, on this picture, uh, from small to medium size to a little bit larger. Um, with this fleet uh, will be... Uh, happy to take you to the places that uh, Christian is now talking about. Now, Christian, um, I'll give uh, the stage to you. Uh, it's your time. Um, it will take about 45 minutes. Um, and I may have a closing word depending uh, on how much time Christian will need. So good luck with it. And uh, nice to have you here. Thanks a lot, Florian. Thanks for the uh, nice introduction. And yeah, hello from Northern Norway. Um, so basically the area where the Rembrandt is operating in winter time, just close by, you might have heard about the famous Lofoten Islands. Don't want to make you too jealous, but that's where I'm sitting right now during these times. So I don't really need to travel, fortunately, to have a nice time. But of course, I'm also tempted like you are um, getting out again. And, and one of my favorite destinations really is Northeastern Greenland. And I want to take you on a little bit of a virtual voyage over there. And this picture here, in a way, really sums up what's so great about Greenland, because, of course, Greenland is a polar destination, like, like many other of our destinations. So there are quite some similarities, but there are also quite some things which are very, very specific for Northeast Greenland. And if I have to point out what's great, what's really special about this part um, of the polar regions. It's really the steep mountains, the scale and the ice. And this sums it up quite well because you see our tiny Plantius, she isn't that small, uh, next to that iceberg uh, and the huge mountains behind in Skolspisund. So really, really, it's, um, Northeast Greenland, it is about ice. It's about icebergs and, and huge glaciers. And if you have a look at those icebergs down there, they're all kind of dwarfing our motor vessels, just to give you the scale again. And it's about landscape, about mountains, about colors. Um, and on this picture, you see a very happy geologist uh, to be able to, to enjoy that very, very specific landing. If those two pictures trigger you, then you're probably staying with me for the next 45 minutes. And I want to take you on a little bit of a, a voyage over there. And Florian already mentioned a couple of different itineraries. And basically, there are two main ones if you want to go to Greenland with us. Number one is the typical voyage once we are done with our Spitsbergen season, Svalbard season, end of August early September, we're kind of packing our stuff and we go over from Spitsbergen to Northeast Greenland and end in Iceland. This is a 13 night voyage. And this is kind of the classical route uh, getting over there. That's the number one. And the second option is basically going from Iceland, uh, either by our motor vessels or with the uh, Rembrandt van Rijn, 
um, and then using the plane as well into Scorsbysund and focusing on that area. I will talk a bit more about those uh, itineraries later, but just keep that in mind for the moment. There's a long one going from Spitsbergen over to Greenland, ending in Iceland, and then there's the shorter ones focusing just on this one a specific area in Greenland, the Scorsbysund. Before I take you on my journey, I want to talk just a bit about Greenland, because Greenland itself um, has uh, a scale which is just beyond. If you look at the numbers, Greenland has more than 2 million square kilometers, and that's just a number. But if I tell you it's half of the size of the whole European Union, while having 56,000 inhabitants, that really puts things in perspective. And um, I've traveled Greenland uh, quite a bit since 2010. I've been in the famous Disco Bay. I'm sure you've heard about that close to Ilulisat. Uh, I've been in the Southwest all along this coast down to Nanotalik. And the kayak trips uh, Florian briefly mentioned, I did in Tasilak, Amasalik for a couple of years. Uh, so I've seen quite a bit of Greenland, but really the Northeast is something special. And I want to talk a bit about why. And if you remember the numbers I just told you, now we are looking at the national park in the northeast of Greenland, which is, by the way, the biggest national park in the world, close to 1 million square kilometers. So roughly, yeah, close to half of the size of Greenland, 45% yeah, or so. And if you just imagine now Greenland being densely populated on the west coast, everything is relative, right? So out of those 56,000 people, more than 50,000 people are living at the West Coast. Um, a good 2,000 in Tasilak. And in the National Park, we have around 35 year round. Three, five, 35 people. And this is where we want to bring you. So this really puts things in perspective. So when we are going from uh, Spitsbergen over to Northeast Greenland, we are aiming for roughly that area which I'm pointing at with the laser pointer right now. And the Skolspisund is just south of that national park, close to Itakotomit. That's the other region we are looking at. So in short words, there's not so many people who have been there. And again, yeah, we have different options in going there. This is a rare picture of a uh, motor vessel, in this case, the Plantius, together with a Rembrandt in Rüpefjord in Skorspisund. And you could choose either or. On my travel, I want to take you on the Plantius, just as an example. It, could, it might as well be the, the Ortelius, the Hondius, or the Jansonius in the future. Um, and I take you on this route. So the 13 night voyage starting from Svalbard, going over the Greenland Sea to Northeast Greenland, being there in the National Park and in Skolsbysund, and then ending off in Akure, Iceland. This is really a voyage focusing on Northeast Greenland, so we are not spending too much time in Spitsbergen. Yeah. But we're heading off in Longyearbyen, uh, which many of you might know from travels before. I, I guess also many clients have been to Svalbard before and uh, think of a new destination coming to Greenland now. But we have a good full day in Spitsbergen as well on this voyage. And we start like every voyage with a lot of briefings. Uh, once we board, just after four o'clock in the afternoon, generally speaking, we have safety briefings and welcome briefings and the drill, of course, the safety drill. Uh, and we head straight out that evening. And what we are most likely focusing on, of course, depending on conditions, weather and uh, wildlife, which we've known on the trips before, is the northwest corner in Spitsbergen. So this is where we want to spend a full day before heading over to Greenland. And there's a couple of things we have in mind for that full day. 
this packed day, and one is really stretching our legs. Of course, we all have a long travel, just coming to Longyearbyen and all those briefings and how to, you know, board the zodiacs and uh, the safety-related matters and walking in polar bear country and so on and so on. So it's time to just get out. So we always try to give you a good hike uh, for those that want a longer one um, up the mountains in the northwest corner. That's one thing we really want to do just to arrive where we are aiming to go. A second thing we always try on this specific voyage is to look out for wildlife very, very early on the trip. Because we just know from experience that Greenland is a tough place for wildlife. Of course, there is wildlife. I will come back to that. But Greenland isn't easy. Greenland, generally speaking, uh, is the home of many very uh, animals that are rather shy. So if you have the chance in Spitsbergen to already have a look at walrus and they're still hanging out at the beaches, it's late in the season, so we don't know, then we might take that opportunity. And of course, if we see the king of the Arctic, the cream-colored polar bear somewhere on the beaches, we might have the chance to get a closer look either from the ship or maybe even from the zodiacs. It's just one full day, so we try to make the most of it. So I'm pretty sure you will be tired after that, uh, that day on Svalbard. But that's good, because now we're heading off towards Greenland. And it can be looking like this. You can be lucky. It can be nice and beautiful, a lot of time on deck. And obviously, we will also offer a lot of lectures on those two full days. So basically, when we are leaving Spitsbergen on the second day of our voyage, day three and four will be at sea. And normally in the morning hours of day five, we are coming to Greenland. But that, of course, depends on wind direction, ice conditions, and so on. So we have two full days at sea, maybe like this, watching birds, photographing birds, looking out for marine mammals, but maybe it can also be like this. You know? Generally speaking, these seas aren't too rough, luckily. Yeah? So we are a bit too far north to, to um, really hit the worst storms. Um, so often the seas are fairly okay. Of course, if your customers are very prone to seasickness, it's, it's a good idea to take precautions. And if it's uh, really rough, we will also tell you on board, uh, on forehand, obviously. But in general, this isn't, isn't the worst part of the open seas. It's not like the Drake Sea, um, the Drake Passage down towards Antarctica, which you might know from experience. Another thing we try to do on our way to Greenland is obviously having a look at some ice. So look, let's have a look at this chart. A lot of colors, so I'll help you. You see the laser pointer in the northwest corner of Spitsbergen. That's where we're starting our journey over the ocean. And where I'm heading now, this is where we end our journey over the open ocean uh, towards the North National Park in northeast Greenland. So what you see is that our general route can fit quite well with the ice edge because these colors here, the green and the yellow and the orange and the red, it's just a color code for how much ice there is. And red, that's super dense, thick pack ice where you need an icebreaker. But yellow and orange can be a very nice ice for us on the Plantios or the Otelios, for instance, to play a bit around and have a look obviously for wildlife, but also just feeling the ice and then uh, just the pack ice itself is really something splendid, which many of you, I'm sure, agree on. Um, but the ice conditions are different every year. So it might be that that ice edge is a lot further north and we have open seas, so it's easy for us to get to Greenland. There's no obstacle, but well, we won't see ice, not this kind of ice, not the sea ice. But it might also be that the ice is way further south and we have to make a big loop and it even takes us longer to get to Greenland. We never know. This ice shot is from 2019, from our voyage. And we were really lucky 
to explore really good ice, even at a good time of the day. So not in the middle of the night, that's another thing. And this is how it looked. And if you look carefully, you see we were indeed very lucky. I zoom a bit in. And you see a polar bear family. This was a mother with two cubs uh, feeding on a seal, we believe. We were too late to witness that kill. But of course, that's like winning in the lottery, finding the ice, having good condition, visibility, and then even finding the polar bears. But what it shows you, we should always try. If there's any point, we will always try. And if you look carefully, who spotted it? <laughs> Somebody spotted number four already? Yeah, there was another one Yeah, um, that just waited for his time or her time to feed on the carcass too. Again, winning in the lottery, but we will always try. After those two full days at sea, we are heading towards Greenland. And this is how it looks from a satellite. So you see it's uh, deep cut fjords. You can already imagine high mountains and uh, great glaciers. And this is roughly our route in there on that voyage. So our very first stop quite often could be here. It's called Mückbukta. And then we are heading deeper into Kaiser Franz Josef Fjord, which is maybe the most beautiful fjord in the world. I don't know, but it's one of the most beautiful ones, that's for sure. And this is how it looks there. It's uh, it's quite a hut that somebody built there. And uh, before I continue with our journey, I just want to take a little anecdote out here about history. Not too much, but um, I already told you Greenland is really the place for people that love landscape and ice and a big scale. Um, but Greenland is definitely also a place for people who are interested in history. And this is just a little example. Because this hut is actually a Norwegian hut. Uh, and the Norwegians even hoisted the Norwegian flag here in 1931 and claimed that area for Norway. And that's a bit odd because most of us know that Greenland was under Danish sovereignty uh, since 1814, so quite a while. Luckily, the Greenlanders are not deciding a lot more on their own um, in Nuuk. So these days they're not as dependent on Denmark anymore, but many, many uh, years or even centuries, it was like this. But the Norwegians had other plans. And to explain you why, I come back to this slide, which we already remember. Um, and basically there were no people in Northeast Greenland. You see now, even now there's not many people in that area of Greenland. So Norway basically said, okay, okay, you claim Greenland, but if you don't have any people there, uh, you're not really showing uh, the world that you own this. And we Norwegians have been here for many decades with our trappers, with our hunters, and we built many huts, which actually means it should be Norwegian territory. That's what the Norwegians did. And just to enforce that claim, they built even more huts and they sent even more trappers. Wasn't so successful in 1933 uh, in Den Haag. It was decided that whole of Greenland should be Danish. The Norwegians were still allowed to hunt and to trap actually, but this was the Danish kingdom now. Uh, but there was one, um, there was one uh, thing that people in Den Haag also said, and that was, if you really want to own it in, its, in the future, Denmark should mo show more presence. Because actually the Norwegians were right, you're not showing enough presence to own that country. And that's why we have the famous Sirius Patrol. And this is a lucky picture in many, many ways. You see the Plansius in the back, it's from 2013. And that was in a time when we were still allowed uh, to visit the headquarters of the Danish Sirius Patrol, which is a military unit, which is also the police up there, um, and which works by boat in summertime and in wintertime, 
basically by dog sledge. So they're using dogs to go along the whole coast. Again, look at the scale. They're going north to south. They make about 20,000 kilometers every year on their sledges with the dogs, just dog powered to show this is Danish territory. If you're really lucky, we might meet them anyway when they're on a, on a boat excursion, uh, showing presence. They could control us, what we're doing, if we have the right permit and so on. It's, it's rather complicated in the national park. Um, but that's our little sidestep to history. Um, yeah. But back to our landing. This is Mikbukta. It's lovely landscape, uh, very easy to walk. It might be a bit boggy and wet, but it's, uh, it's very green tundra. And this is also the place where we can guarantee you to see your first muskox. We hope to see a live ones too, obviously. Uh, it's a bit of a joke, obviously, because uh, this is the closest we can guarantee you to get to them. Um, but there's also some serious uh, facts behind this that I choose this picture because, again, it's not so easy to see animals on a close distance in Greenland. Animals are still, still very, very shy, but of course we try our best. First landing, quite often there, but this is what we are hoping for the next morning. We hope to get you up really, really early. And that's what we do quite often on that voyage. Because we have one thing now in Greenland which we really don't have in the main season of Spitsbergen, and that's sunrise and sunset. Obviously, the midnight sun is really nice, which we have on Svalbard. But for photography, for light conditions, it's just too harsh. It's too much light. So now in Greenland, as we are approaching the autumn, we suddenly have conditions where the mountains are just glowing. And that means that the expedition team will always be early on the bridge. We will always write in the program when the sun rises, the daily program, so when the sun rises and when the sun sets. So you can always set your alarm. But if it's really nice, we will wake you up with a gentle voice. And then you can decide if you really get up, but you should, because this is golden. And that's quite often quite early, especially in early September. We are talking about, you know, getting up 4.30-ish. Uh, with every day, the days get shorter. So, so at some point you can stand up at 5.30, which is a relief, isn't it? But um, it's worth it. Yeah. And that's the famous Teufelsschloss. Uh, the Devil's Castle. It has a German name even because there were some Swiss researchers in that region um, climbing the mountains. But this is a really, really splendid way to start the day from the ship. It can also look like this. It's early autumn. Uh, we, we get the first snow sometimes, yeah, sometimes even down to sea level, that can happen. Um, but of course, we are hoping for conditions like this. Again, a huge iceberg, bigger than our motor vessels, and the sun just shining on it, on that low, beautiful angle. The mountains, the layers, it's, it's really a place for photographers, landscape photographers, um, but also just enjoying, of course, out on deck. Again, the Teufelsschloss from a different angle, the Devil's Castle. This is early in the morning. And now we're taking a breakfast. Huh? Try to calm down a bit and try to do a landing just after breakfast. And that's uh, very nearby. So if conditions allow, we go to Blomsterbüchte, the Flower Bay. Uh, and that's a typical landing in Greenland. So if people ask you how, how it's supposed to look uh, there, uh, what's the conditions, is it, is it rough to walk? Well, it's, it's very often these hills, which are not necessarily too steep, uh, which are kind of rounded by the glaciers in the Ice Age. Um, of course, having some steep steps here and there. It can be rocks, it can be vegetation, it's a lot of lakes, it's mixture. Um, and you wonder what are those people looking at? 
You see it? That's a black dot. That's a muskox again. And I remember these muskox that was back in 2013. They really didn't like to be approached too much. So they just kept the distance and then we didn't bother them. So that can be a typical muskox sighting or like this. Here you at, at least see the body shape. Yeah. But of course we try our best. Um, and I will come back to you later in the talk about wildlife in general. But I really want to point out if you're really, really keen on wildlife and close encounters, please don't expect anything like the Antarctic or South Georgia, where you can basically just walk up to the animals and not even like Svalbard, uh, where also animals are maybe a bit more shy uh, than in Antarctica, but not nearly as shy as in Greenland. So Greenland really is a place for landscape and scale. Beautiful view from a little hill. We hiked up a mountain there, uh, which I think was close to 400 meters high, um, with the ones that wanted to, to really stretch their legs after the sea days we had before, um, while the others just enjoyed the tundra and had more time for the muskox. Um, but we had a very happy guide up there, looking just straight on Teufelsschloss. Beautiful place. What is different in Greenland than uh, from some other travels I find at least is, of course, we have that landing in the morning and we have another activity, landing, zodiac cruise, whatever it is in the afternoon. And, and you could think that you can take a break in the meantime. And obviously also in Antarctica and in, in Spitsbergen, it's, it's nice to look out from the ship to the scenery, but not in the same way maybe as in Greenland. Because if it's lovely weather, this is just transit. This picture is just going from Blomsterbucht to our next location. Um, you really don't want to go in. You don't even want to have your lunch, some of you. Um, and at least you want to be fast and just being out there again and looking at that fabulous geology, the tilted mountains, the sediments and, and red and orange and yellow and all those colors. Yeah, this is the Antarctic Sound uh, coming out of Kaiser Franz Josef Fjord, heading to our next landing, which could be Maria Ö or Ella Ö, um, named by a Swedish expedition. And here you see us on Maria Ö uh, with different groups walking. I think that was a middle hike down there on the lower hills. And again, you see it's rounded landscape, beautiful background. Uh, this is a rather easier walk there. And generally speaking, it's it's not too tough uh, if you don't want to make it too tough, you know, if you know what I mean. Of course, you can always climb a mountain, but you can take it easy and, and have a have a good walk um, anyway. Next day, um, often we head into um, Alpefjord and the Segelsels carpet. And if I have to choose my favorite landing in Northeast Greenland, it's this one. And I'm not a geologist, but I can appreciate that because this color, this playful color game is, is just beyond. Um, and this is old sediments, I think 350 million years old, uh, and, and the environment changed uh, constantly. So that's why I got different layers and yellow and red and orange just piled up onto each other. And then you have no vegetation on top. So you all, you see that beautiful geology. Um, and of course, we hope for sunshine. So it really sticks out well. I remember one time being there with a colleague, Andrew, uh, Andrew Bishop is a geologist. Some of you might know him. And we went ashore and it was snow, snow overnight, sleet and snow. So he basically called the bridge and said, I need a couple of rooms because he had to get away that snow. So show the people, show the guests how beautiful it is. Um, but of course, this is what we hope for. Again, the colors, the sunsets just beyond. And, and I can't get enough of it. Um, and, and many pictures taken on our 2019 voyage on the Plantius.
So this part was Kaiser Franz Josef Fjord. This part is actually where we go into the national park. Um, so keep that in mind for the, if you want to choose a voyage, because all the pictures that follow from now on, they are in Skorispisund, in that area. And basically all of our voyage go there. Also the shorter ones. Yeah. Also the voyages starting from Iceland. Um, seven nights, eight nights, ten nights. They're also going in Skorspisund. And certainly Skorspisund has a lot to offer. Um, but it maybe doesn't have the full remoteness of the national park. Uh, that's what makes Kaiser Franz Josef Fjord and the national park so extremely special. This is how it looks in Skorspisund, especially if you get all the way in, into the fjord, you actually get quite a warm summer climate. It's, it's really, really cold in winter, but because it's so continental and you're far away uh, from the open sea, after all, Skorspisund is the largest fjord system in the world, so more than 200 kilometers long. So, of course, imagine all the way in there, it's pretty continental. Uh, and that's what the vegetation actually likes. Summers are warm in the growing period and you get the uh, bushes and uh, uh, birches and, and, and so on that are partly knee deep or even hip deep. And that's more than we get on a Svalbard, Spitsbergen, for instance. A lot of details around. Uh, we get this beautiful Indian summer there, uh, especially in uh, September, um, early September. We get the yellow, the orange, and yeah, really something also for the people that don't necessarily want to hike up every other hill, but think it's nice to just enjoy. It's nice to just, you know, go horizontal with your camera, lie on the ground and take a lot of uh, macro photography. It, it's certainly uh, a good place for that too. And then in the background, those, those planted mountains. This is on Milneland in Skorspisund. Uh, and in the background, you see Grünwigschöcken. That's this mountain. It's uh, named after a cathedral in Copenhagen uh, because it kind of resembles this one with a lot of fantasy. But it is a mountain close to 2,000 meters high, just straight from the fjord. And it was climbed the first time sometime in the 1990s, so not that long ago. And there are still a lot of unclimbed mountains actually in Northeast Greenland, just because it's so remote. And just this mountain is so unbelievable photogenic yeah, from all the different perspectives. Here you see it, a colleague of mine, uh, Sandra Petrovic, taking a picture, uh, approaching with the Plantius. Uh, into this fjord, the Ö fjord, and another picture in that beautiful light with an iceberg in front. Of course, we hope to be there when it's dawn or dusk, um, but, but even midday foggy conditions, it can be splendid. Uh, and again, think about the scale looks so tiny or plantious. Yeah, I talked a lot about landscape, but obviously it's also about ice. And uh, if you want great icebergs, uh, scale, you know, sometimes kilometers long, then you either have to go to Antarctica or to Greenland. You don't really find that in Spitsbergen. You have beautiful icebergs in Spitsbergen, but they're tiny compared to what you see in Greenland. All of these are bigger than our motor vessels. Keep that in mind. But it's not only the scale. It's, of course, also the shape, the colors. Um, and we do our best to, to get you close and safe with our motor vessels or the Rembrandt uh, close up to those icebergs. And they never look the same. Yeah? Sometimes we see huge ones and we pass them again next day and they're broken apart. Um, and you see this one turned quite a bit. That's why you still have that old line that was grounded once, the water line. 
And again, beautiful from the ship, but also beautiful from a different perspective, high up on a nice little hike. It's a scale, it's the ice, it's a light, evening light with the moon. I mean, what more can you ask for? The only problem we sometimes have, especially us, the expedition team, we, we know how, how rare it is that it, everything comes together, of course. So if we have a couple of days like this, we, we barely can sleep. We don't allow ourselves to sleep. Um, it, it's just too beautiful. The skies, you know. Can't really get enough of that. So I talked a lot about the light. There's one specific light phenomena you might think I didn't talk about yet. So it's coming now. Obviously, Aurora Borealis, the northern lights are also something we would like to see and would like to show you on board. Um, Greenland during this September is kind of the perfect time and the perfect place to be. Uh, if you look at the auroral oval, how we call it, so that's where the aurora can be seen. Often Greenland, the place where we are, is just in the middle of it. Yeah. So if there's some auroral activity, then we are at the right spot. If it's not cloudy, that's the second thing we want to have. Yeah. And uh, 2019, we had three nights in a row, which were just fantastic, beautiful. Uh, everybody... Uh, really sleepy the next days. Um, but of course, if you want to photograph them, it can be tricky from a moving ship. Um, we try to drift really slow uh, during those nights, if we can, if we don't have too much to travel. Uh, we Sometimes we can anchor too. Um, but of course, there's still some movement on the ship. So if you want the perfect picture of Northern Lights, it's, it's pretty tricky from a ship. Then you might rather want to go on the Norderlicht, which Florian mentioned, at uh, uh, Rembrandt van Rijn, and the Norderlicht still in 2001, but um, in 2022, we will operate only with the Rembrandt in northern Norway. Uh, this is a good place to, to go ashore and, and have a proper setup with a tripod. But if you just want to explore it, if you just want to see the northern lights, it's fantastic to go to Greenland. And with modern day camera equipment, you can do quite a bit. This is taking from a moving ship. It's maybe not good enough to have put it on your wall. Yeah, it certainly isn't. But if you look at this series, it will be a series now. So you see a couple of pictures. Taking from a moving ship, slowly drifting. You see how the light was moving. You see the stars are not perfectly sharp, but you see the green, the purple. It's uh, good enough, I would say. It's a, it's a very, very good uh, memory you, you can uh, have in your pocket, on your SD card, uh, and the rest should be here. No. But I just wanted to mention that, that it can be tricky from a moving ship. But with every year, year that goes, equipment gets better. So cameras are, are pretty insane these days uh, with, with short um, uh, shutter speeds. Yeah, but of course, that's something we definitely try. Uh, and if we are unlucky, if we have a lot of clouds, and if there's not so much activity, we just want to let you know that we will always have a watch. I mean, we some of us has to be out there and check. And then we will wake you up if we believe it's still there five minutes later. Yeah, we already had a lot of webinars. Uh, Floria mentioned that about Spitsbergen, South Georgia, and so on. So I don't want to talk too much in detail about how we actually go ashore. But of course, Northeast Greenland, we do it very, very similar to other places. We have our little rubber boats, the Zodiacs. And from the Plantius, for instance, we can bring you in there like this and shuttle you ashore for our landings um, or doing a Zodiac cruise. A landing typically looks like this. 
This could be a very typical landing in Rüppelfjord here. Uh, and very, very often they are not too rough. Yeah, it can be windy, obviously, but we don't get the swell most places. Uh, so we can often keep you dry, but it can be very shallow. So that's why we need the rubber boots, which we have on the motor vessels um, for you to to rent, to, to borrow um, during during the time on board. Um, but of course, it can also the odd day look like this. Yeah, but that's not something we expect to regularly. It's not like South Georgia. Um, most time, it's it's way nicer, less windy, less swelly weather conditions. Hoping to bring you ashore at a place like this. This is Rödeö, who could come up with a better name for that island, the Red Island, how it translates. Uh, and this is very close to an iceberg graveyard, like we call it. So the icebergs are stranded there because it's shallow waters. So, of course, that gives you a, a great view on those giants. Either doing the landings with the zodiacs or the cruises. This is a zodiac cruise close to the geology of the Red Island. This uh, columns of uh, basalt, dolerite or obviously in the ice, yeah? On the big icebergs, it's the best to actually have a look from the, from the larger ships, um, but the small details, just for changing perspective, it's, it's very nice to sit in a small boat, have a low angle, and for instance, taking photographs like this, as you can see again from my colleague, Sandra. On such a small iceberg, piece of ice, you can also approach a bit closer, obviously. Of course, on our cruises, on our landings, we are always looking out for wildlife. So, so coming back to that, certainly there is the chance. Yes, there is a chance to see the odd seal. This was a young one. There's a chance to get actually a proper view, a closer view on Moscox like this one. But seeing a Moscox like this, is a very, very, very good sighting already. Yeah, a couple of hundred meters away with the tele lens taken. Um, it's good with your binos, obviously. Always bring binoculars on those trips. Um, they are shy animals, so it isn't that easy. The good thing with Arctic hair is that they're white all year round. So let's hope there's no snow yet then they're at least easy to spot if they're there. Yeah? So then, then we can be lucky. So that's one thing we can also uh, not expect, but what we hope for. And this was a lucky encounter with a polar fox, an Arctic fox, which already turned to white, the winter color, and which was actually quite curious. Back to that king of the Arctic, yeah. Uh, of course, we can see uh, the polar bear. That's why we have rifles and that's why we always stay in groups. And that's why we are super careful um, if we can't look behind the next rock. But usually, if we see a bear in Northeast Greenland, which we definitely don't do every trip, far from, then it's a sighting like this. It's far away, somewhere on the rocks. They're just sitting there. They're waiting for the ice to come back. The sea ice yeah, is that. Uh, and, and they're not curious. They're not interested. And they're probably hungry. So definitely not the ones you want to meet um, too close. And yeah, some people are very, very specific. What is this? Hmm. This is a gear falcon, a rare falcon uh, in, in Greenland. Uh, yeah, there might be the odd passenger that is really, really keen on a specific bird species or so. And then, of course, Greenland can be interesting if, if there's no other place you can really see them. But um, it, it is tough. And again, why is that? Why is it so tough? Um, it's not so densely populated, is it? But if you uh, look at Greenland, we know that there have been people in Greenland for at least 5,000 years or so. Uh, actually, we know that there have been people 2,500 before 
Christ was born in Independence Fjord in Northeast Greenland. And they came in waves, um, those cultures, uh, depending on the climate, um, some of the cultures died out and new ones came. But basically during those 5,000 years, there have been people most of the time. Yeah. And they live from hunting, exclusively from hunting and gathering during those 5,000 years. So obviously the animals have adapted and are very, very shy. Sometimes we can uh, also have a look at old houses, for instance, here from a Thule culture house. That's the culture that came about a thousand years ago um, to Greenland, and which is actually the ancestors of modern day Inuit. Um, but very, very often there's not much to be seen because it's basically it's so long ago. Yeah? So we have just a couple of rocks and we have to use a little bit of the fantasy to imagine that people have lived there. But just imagine the harsh conditions where they lived. And yeah, there are still people living there. Just south of the National Park, we have Itukutomit. This is normally the last visit we have um, on our voyages. 350 people living there, and they're still living nearly exclusively from hunting. So with our Western views, we have to be a bit careful. Yeah, there, there's always you know, something hanging for drying, some food, some seal. Yeah, some polar bear. This might be hard to see. This might be hard to swallow because we want to see them alive. But there's a quota system so which makes sure the Inuit can't just hunt as many polar bears as they want. Yeah, there is a quota. And just remember, it is their culture. They have always hunted and they still hunt basically just for surviving. So better than talking about them and thinking, of things, try to just get a little bit of a talk to the local people. I always try that with my little Danish English mixture and uh, you hear good stories here and there and uh, it's, it's worth it. You know? If people are interested, if they have a open face expression and, and try it, a little talk uh, and that's appreciated. And I think we can learn a lot too. Often our last stop, and then we're heading to Iceland, where we have a fair chance of seeing some marine mammals, um, some humpback whales here. We can see white-beaked dolphins on our way. And that stretch to Iceland can be a bit rougher too. Yeah, Thinking about seasickness, this is often where we have a, the odd storm. But at least you've been on the ship now for 12 days, so, so everybody's used to it, uh, that the ship is moving slightly which makes it a lot better. I don't want to talk too much more. Um, this was my little voyage, 13 night voyage uh, from Svalbard to Iceland um, via Northeast Greenland on a motor vessel. But I just want to mention, there is the option to do a very similar voyage on the Rembrandt uh, with the difference that it's 18 nights, so it's longer. And it's also ending in Constable Point in Skorsbysund. So you don't have to do the Denmark Strait in the end. That might be a good thing. yeah. Uh, and you have more time in the fjords. But of course, you also have a slower ship. Uh, you have more flexibility, but you need to be more flexible thinking about the weather. Yeah? That voyage can be interesting. Um, if you're into that, if you like small ships, if you like to be hands-on, if, you, if you're okay with that, that there is maybe a half day of just sailing and no landing because sailing needs time. Yeah? If you love that, that's a good thing. And then you can have hands on. The other thing is the focus on Skorspisund. And those voyages you can have either on a motor vessel, but also on the Rembrandt. So the difference is, if you look on the left-hand side, yeah, this is a typical agenda itinerary on a motor vessel going from Akure via the Denmark Strait into Skorsbysund, seven or eight nights, four full days uh, in Skorsbysund, and then going back to Iceland. A really good program uh, if you want 
to have some time on Iceland before or after and have a look at the highlights there. And on the right hand side, you see on the Rembrandt, we do it a bit differently, 10 or 11 nights, so longer, and no Denmark script. So you focus on the being in Skosbysund, you need a bit more time, um, but it can be, it can be very nice too uh, on our smaller sailing vessel. And of course, now it gets a bit more specific uh, with all those different itineraries. Um, I'm sure the people in the office, Floria and co can tell you more and you can always approach them. But there are certain trips where we have uh, photography workshops, um, where we have a kayaking option, a base camp option with more hikes and photography and so on. I told you photography is a good thing there. Um, so if you look at the itineraries, uh, you might see some things that might interest your, your guests. Uh, a bit more specific. Um, and with that, I would like to end. Uh, but of course, there might be some questions from your side. Okay, Christian, thank you very much for this uh, fabulous talk and uh, very impressive pictures. I've seen this presentation now for the third time and I still want to go there. It's brilliant. So it is a really, really uh, unique uh, destination to travel to. Christian pretty much said uh, everything um, covered well on the routes and uh, the ships, the different types of programs. I just want to highlight uh, that in the program for 2022 has just recently been uh, revised and uh, refined. So you will find by next week uh, a mailing in your inbox announcing some uh, new trips in 2022 uh, and added activities uh, to our voyages that can be booked either free of charge if that is a base camp voyage for instance that includes uh, hiking kayaking and uh, free photo workshops um, or some of these activities are also supplemented if you choose a specific kayak uh, uh, skills progression camp for instance that is going to teach you from uh, all the skills from scratch uh, so that can all be um, uh, chosen from our uh, program and portfolio um, uh, Watch your inbox next week. Uh, it will be out. Some of the trips are online uh, already. In 2022, uh, we have uh, in total about uh, 12 uh, Greenland itineraries. Those 13 nighters uh, with our mot motor vessels from uh, North uh, Spitsbergen to Northeast Greenland to Spitsbergen. And uh, we have a number of uh, seven nighters uh, starting ending in Iceland in Akureyri and those Rembrandt trips, uh, six of them uh, that start and end in uh, Greenland and uh, which are very uh, comfortable to uh, get to because uh, we fly our passengers out from uh, uh, Spitsbergen, uh, sorry, from uh, Iceland. Uh, by chartered planes and uh, that's what we are looking at at uh, 2022. 2021 is still ahead of us, uh, certainly um, a challenging uh, season ahead of us, uh, bearing in mind that we still have a corona situation around. Um, some of you might be asking what is the situation about it? Uh, well, we are monitoring the situation, we'll see what the governments are deciding on lockdowns, so will they ease it, will they go more stricter about it? Uh, a lot of uh, things are happening uh, uh, these days, uh, these uh, coming weeks. Um, I'll just want to say our trips in the summer um, are still intact and uh, they are also bookable. However, someone who would like to, to book uh, a trip of a lifetime may also has time to wait another year uh, until 2022. We have a wonderful program uh, rolled out for the next year and there's a lot of uh, trips to uh, choose from. Um, for you, there was a question here or um, a remark in the comments. Uh, what about the webinar? Um, we will be um, circulating the recording of the webinar in a follow-up email uh, possibly tomorrow or a day after and uh, then you have our email addresses uh, please be in contact if you have uh, closer uh, or more detailed questions and we'll try to to answer them well thank you very much for your time we are a little bit over um, our time thank you very much christian for your time um, it was a pleasure having you here today um, on this uh, webinar um, you have really a lot of knowledge and uh, I think you fired us uh, up, uh, all of us. And um, yeah, be in touch again. Thank you.
uh, stay well, stay healthy and uh, be in contact and see you around. Thank you very much. Bye for now.